step in my dojo, you step, 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 step. Step in my dojo, you step in my Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ill Gates coming at you from Dojo HQ here on Dojo TV with a special episode about redlining. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard about redlining a DJ mixer, but this is another much less fun type of redlining that I feel it is important to know about. So I only recently learned about a practice known as redlining, which is a form of institutionalized racism and classism that still exists today, even though it's illegal. So I learned about this from a few friends of mine uh, and a call in the immediate wake of the George Floyd uh, protests. And I invite a bunch of my friends to help me learn more about why people are so upset and really what's going on in America and around the world so that I and the dojo could help be on the right side of all these things. So one of the wonderful people who came onto that call with the producer dojo is our dear friend, the very talented Rita, AKA DJ Canvas. What's up Rita? How hey, you hey, doing? Good to see you, man, always. Yes, yeah, so she's nice enough to take some time out of her day to teach me and teach everybody about redlining. And I think that redlining is something that we should all know about as people who are trying to be responsible citizens and understand the world around us and understand kind of what's going on in society. I think it's a really good idea for us to all learn about redlining together. And we've put together at the end of this, we've put together a, a little test that you can take to see if you understand what's going on. And if you understand and can pass the test about redlining, we're going to give you the project folder for my track with Unk Trapezoid. And if yeah. you remix that project, you can submit it and potentially be on the Trapezoid Remix EP. This is part of our new series called Conversation Starters, where at the dojo we're going to be starting important conversations and for those who can pass the test at the end you will get free samples or project files or other very cool things so all you got to do is free your mind and you get free samples and stuff i think it's a win-win for everyone involved and this is the kickoff so <laughs> without further ado uh, i'm gonna pass it over to rita who is gonna start a conversation with us about redlining all right. Thank you so much once again for joining us, Rita. Take it away. Yeah, yeah. And so like Dylan said, we're starting the conversation just to get everyone aware of these different topics and so that you can educate yourself and dive in further and have some call to action. So this is the beginning. This is the surface. Um, and we'll dive in. And as you guys find out and learn more, I'd love to see the discussions that happen. Reach out to me. Reach out to Dylan in the dojo and share, share what you learn. Um, yeah, and for, for sure, I'd just also like to point out, too, that we are by no means experts on these subjects. Uh, a lot of this is new to me. I've been doing a bunch of my own research, uh, as, as has, has Rita. And basically, we just, uh, just want to get this topic in the community, you know, and figure out together kind of some, some steps we can take. We've, we've uncovered some steps, and we've, we've taken some steps so far. Uh, but really, this is a conversation that is, is intended to be an ongoing conversation in the producer dojo community uh, because I feel like, you know, we have a really vibrant, really compassionate community of people. And um, if the more, the more we're talking about these topics and the more we're engaging with each other and just being a part of this conversation, I think that only good things can happen. Yeah, for sure. All right, we're up. So, okay, so let's uh, let's talk about redlining. What exactly is redlining, Rita? Yeah, so redlining is a process in which banks deny mortgages, loans, and insurances to certain and particular neighborhoods. And these neighborhoods are often low-income neighborhoods or neighborhoods that are full of people of color. So that's what redlining is from a fundamental uh, perspective. Okay, cool. So um, why is it a problem to use what neighborhood someone is? when you're like deciding whether to give them a loan? Yeah, well, see, the the assumptions that went into defining what neighborhood was good or what was bad were based, were racist, right? They were racist and classist assumptions. So it was really a means of keeping color lines and saying, okay, 
all right, you have an address here that's predominantly black. Oh, we're going to say this is too risky of an area to uh, give you a loan or give you an insurance or give you a mortgage. So it's uh, that's why it's fundamentally wrong. And right. It's not people helping people out, getting them loans to buy a home. It's just saying, nope, I don't like your race. Uh, you don't make the money I want you to make. Denied. OK, so. Um... So as, as like, as I understood it, right, like the banks, um, you know, this, this process used to be fine, right? Like they, this used to totally be accepted and now, um, now it's actually illegal. Right, right. Right. So how, how did that happen? How did, how did redlining become illegal? Yeah, so if we, we jump it back, so it was legal back in the 1930s, 1933. The homeowners loan uh, corporation created these things called residential risk maps. So I'm gonna I'm gonna screen share with you right here. Yeah, let's, check out, let's check out one of these maps and see what's yeah, up. Yeah, let's look at this. So we're gonna share screen, boom. And we'll have this resource available for you guys because it's really incredible. So um, Richmond, um, the University of Richmond did this great map of showing all the redlining that occurred across the US. So if you're looking here, you're looking at a map of the US. I am in Atlanta. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on Atlanta to show you what these maps look like, right? So in 1930, can you zoom in a little bit. Yeah, can you can you see that here? Yeah, maybe maybe just see if you can zoom in on your. Yeah, there we go. Okay, yeah, is cool. that, that better? Cool. Yeah, so we got some vintage Atlanta here. Yeah, uh, we can see there's there's like you know four different kind of color right. codes here. Yeah, so in 1933 they created these maps and they would mark. This is where it gets the name redlining. They would mark areas that were too risky or less desirable in shades of red and they would literally outline that neighborhood with the red line or markets so that's where we get the name from and what they used to determine um what was too risky to lend to was basically race it came down to race um, and it came down to to class as well a little bit in 1968 the practice of doing that was outlawed but you had 30 years you know or so of this practice going on and, and to that point, even though it was outlawed and it's illegal today, it's still something that's hard to capture and identify and call out, right? To see like, oh, this this bank or this loaning institution is practicing redlining. But yeah, these are what the, the fundamental basis of it, this map. So these maps are like kind of um, like some of them are published now, as I understand it. But um, at the time, they were not really public. These were these are maps that were used behind closed doors right like in the in the um decision making process of of these institutions and um basically you know like this uh this this process is illegal what, what was the act that was uh that was passed that was like it was a, it was a fair housing act in 1968 right okay. that said okay this process of redlining is is illegal we'll stop sharing so we can see you yeah and a lot of this stuff like um uh, like for example, I learned um, a lot of the, like I I was always yeah, living in Chinatowns. So like Chinatowns are a great place to live when you're an artist. So when I lived in Toronto, I lived in uh, two of the different Chinatowns. There are many Chinatowns in Toronto, but I lived in two of the different Chinatowns uh, right. in Toronto. And I was kind of curious about the history of these neighborhoods, right? And I learned through talking to some of the other people in the neighborhood that Chinatowns in both the United States and in Canada were actually legally enforced ghettos until the 60s. And um, this, you know, because they, they, like a lot of the, the Chinese people in America and uh, Canada, they, you know, they came over and built the railroads, right? So, right. Pe you know, they wanted to use them as a, a cheap source of labor. And, uh, you know, for doing this, like very dangerous, like many Chinese people were like blown up when they're trying to bore holes, like tunnels through the uh, right. mountains and stuff, you know, so they, they, they didn't want they didn't want white workers doing this, you know. So you'd have like a white foreman and then a bunch of Chinese people, and basically, um, you know, they, they wanted that that labor, and uh, they they so when Chinese people were immigrating, it was actually like you were only allowed to bring like X number of Chinese people per unit of weight on a boat, and it was like you know because they were there to help like unload some of the shipping. So this so it was actually like the the immigration itself was tied to coming on boats, which wow. is crazy. That is that uh, is crazy right there. Yeah, and then uh, they were only allowed to own land in Chinatowns, and they were like redlined, like legally enforced ghettos until the '60s. It's crazy. That's so wild, yeah. Uh, super, super crazy. 
So, um, you know, then I guess uh, I'm not sure if the Affordable Housing Act was part of, um, uh, you know, was part of what uh, enabled that to, to stop for Chinese people. But, but yeah, I was shocked to learn this. I was shocked to learn this. Um, so, you know, this was this was on the books until the 60s. These, this, these yeah. redlining practices were on the books until the 60s. Um, and then after the 60s, they it became illegal. And it's my understanding that um, even after it's illegal, because a lot of these processes are, are, are kind of behind closed doors, right, uh, right. Uh, they, they're still happening today. And that basically you got to like catch people doing it. Right, right. Like these maps were available to look at and go, oh, my area is redlined. So let me talk about it. Right. It's, it's still more, more so behind closed doors. Yeah. Cool. So um, uh, when I was doing some of my research, I found out that there was some pretty, um, you know, some pretty big, like if you just check out on the Wikipedia, there's this court section of the redlining Wikipedia page where they talk about some of these um, famous instances where people, uh, people, you know, there were some, some big judgments handed down, but it was um, the, uh, I think it was the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Let's see, where are we here? Uh, yeah, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. That's kind of like the, the, the agency that you want to file your complaints with to, to combat redlining. And basically what people would do is they would come in with these like sting operations, basically, where they would have uh, a POC who is, you know, getting denied, um, housing in a certain area or, or getting denied a loan and then, or getting, you know, they'd go in to look at an apartment and they'd be like, Oh no, the apartment's rented. You can't have it. Right. And then they would have um, a, a, a white person that's like a Confederate acting as um, you know, uh, uh, to help them with this test and this white person with a similar credit rating and similar um, you know, scores or whatever, similar financial means would come in and they'd be like, Oh yeah, for sure. Like, you know, Go, go let's go look at the apartment right and uh basically you know they, they do they do this and then and then file a complaints with the department of housing and urban development and there have been settlements like um associated bank uh in 2015 as recently as 2015 got busted in one of these sting operations and had to hand out a 200 million dollar settlement 2015 man. in 2015 yeah yeah and then um also uh, New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman announced a settlement with Evans Bank uh, for $825,000 in 2015. Uh, so that was also pretty recently. Uh, and then uh, the U.S. Department of Justice announced a $33 million settlement with Hudson City Savings Bank in New Jersey, and New York, and Pennsylvania on uh, September 24th, 2015. So those are recent. Yeah. Like those are like the last five years. Those are, those are recent cases. Um, so another case that I found that I thought was kind of interesting here um, and noteworthy um, is I'm going to just share my screen here. Go to finder and share. There we go. Um, so our yeah. current president, Donald Trump right. uh, was in 1973 he got in hot water and actually the first time he made the papers uh, was for redlining. So he had a, a lawsuit um, that was against the Trump family that was for uh, you know properties that he was managing for his dad, Fred Trump, um, that he got in trouble, uh, Trump Management Inc. got in trouble for redlining. And uh, this was, you know, there's a few different places that this was documented that I was going through, but that was kind of interesting. Um, so a former Trump superintendent named Thomas Miranda testified that multiple Trump management employees had instructed him to attach a separate piece of paper with a big letter C on it for colored to any application filed by a black apartment seeker. Right. So a lot of people, you know, when like in the aftermath of the George Floyd thing, I was really trying to understand a lot of people on the other side and, you know, get to get to know a lot of people who were, uh, you know, who were supporting the, the president. And many of them were like, oh, Trump's never done anything racist. I, you know, please show me one thing that he's done. <laughs> racist. One thing. And, and here is one thing that is very racist. Very that is the first first thing. Thing. For the first time he's ever in the papers. It's shocking. Right. Um, so, um, uh, Basically, um, they had the, the first time the case was 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 put forth. They had this uh, consent degree, uh, where the Trump, um, you know, they did agree to this consent degree, which is kind of like a way where 
um, you know, they, they, they didn't accept full responsibility, but the, they still essentially lost the case. But, um, but yeah, and then it, it kind of continued on. And then later they wore the government down and then there's another case. Uh, but in this um, NPR piece that I found about it, it was kind of interesting. Um, let, I'll just read to you how the lawsuit was, uh, was done here. So the lawsuit was based on evidence gathered by testers for the New York City Human Rights Division, which alleged that black people who went to Trump buildings were told there were no apartments available while white people were offered units. Back then, Sheila Morris worked as one of those testers. When a black New Yorker was turned down for service and racial bias was suspected, Morris, who is white, would be dispatched to see if she received different treatment. In this case, a black man in search of an apartment in Brooklyn in 1972 saw a sign on a building, apartment for rent. He met with the superintendent and the superintendent said, I'm very sorry, but the apartment is rented. It's gone, Morris says. So the gentleman said to him, well, why is the sign out? I still see a sign that says apartment for rent. And the superintendent said, oh, ha, huh, guess I forgot to take it down. So when Morse, and this is Sheila Morse, our, our tester, she went to the building to ask about the same apartment. She says, they greeted me with open arms and showed me every aspect of the apartment. Morse said she reported her experience to the Human Rights Commission and then returned to the apartment building. After she was offered a lease, the black man who had tried to rent the apartment entered the office with a city human rights commissioner and the three of them confronted the building superintendent. He said, well, I'm only doing what my boss told me to do. I am not allowed to rent to black tenants, Morris said. The commissioner asked the building superintendent to take him to his boss and that turned out to be Trump management. Right there, right there. Right there, so that's right there. It's pretty racist. Yeah. It's pretty racist. Yeah. It's pretty racist, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so, so basically, um, you know, that's kind of how a lot of these anti redlining cases are, are, you know, that's how, that's how you investigate. Cause, cause yeah. these maps, they're behind the scenes, you yeah. know, and you can't, you can't just say someone to their face, like, Oh, you're, you're black. You can't run an apartment here. So by, by focusing on the address that the person lives, that's kind of like a, you know, like a placeholder, for race at an exactly. institution level because discriminating against someone based on their visible skin color or whether they're a homosexual or whatever is, is totally illegal. That's, that's right. been illegal for a while. So these kind of, these maps that are still used today in secret um, or, you know, like they didn't like for, and, and for in the Trump case, they didn't write the C on the application. Right. It was on some other it was paper. Another, another piece of paper that right. they added in. So they even knew, they even knew not to put the C right on the application right yeah. so so yeah i thought that was um noteworthy in our Definitely our discussion noteworthy. here um so um so let's talk about like you know what are what are some action steps like aside from setting up one of these sting, sting operations or uh contacting the department of housing and urban development you know yeah. um what are what are some things that, that you can do like how can we how can we work against Redlining here. Yeah, absolutely. So there's this great um, um, organization called the Green Line Institute, and they are active. Very appropriate name. Right. I can't because we didn't find this. This is the second time we've had this conversation. Yeah. The first time we, we didn't know about this. We, we didn't know about know. this. We had to go do some more research. But it's like it's so obvious in retrospect. You're like, oh yeah, redlining. Oh, right. green some green lining. Right. Green lining is totally the solution. Right, and it's like it's such an obvious name. So let me share my screen here, and we'll give okay, you guys cool. this research. Yeah, well. let's learn about green lining. Yeah, so I mean, they just have a bunch of incredible resources here. Um, they're looking at, you know, technology access, ways to combat redlining. This should look familiar from that map I showed you before. They've got this Leadership Academy, which is incredible if you want to do that there. There's opportunities to donate, whether it's financially or whether it's your time. I donated today. I'm stoked. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I mean, so many great resources in this page just to understand how redlining may impact your area, what's being done, how you can combat it, like what you can do as an individual on your level and the local level. Um, so this is just- okay, well, well, let's let's talk about like, um, like what are some kind of action steps that we should know about? Because I mean, setting up one of these sting operations, yeah. that's kind of like, you know, if you want to, if you want to really like punish a specific company or if you want, like, because there's, there's even actually, there's uh, people who, set up some of these sting operations against the Trump uh, organization and actually rented like as POC rented apartments from 
uh, the trend. Because even today, the makeup, the racial makeup in Trump properties is like almost exclusively white. But there are some black families who managed to get into Trump properties by engaging in these, these sting operations. And so like, been, let's I mean, say- been years of this happening. So, right, of course, you see the repercussions still today of practices 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, cause, cause, and the damage of this stuff is, yeah. is it's really lasting damage. Yeah. It's really lasting damage. So, I mean, you know, you can set up one of these kind of sting operations if you, if you really want to get into a specific property or if one of these specific landlords or banks, you know, really like you're, you're upset by this. Right. That's something that you can do at an individual level. But let's talk about like a local level and like a political level and stuff. Um, so so this, this Green Lining Institute, um, you know, they, they're really trying to like help the neighborhoods yeah. themselves, you know, not just like people who are victims of redlining, but the neighborhoods that are uh, victims of redlining. So what are, what are some of the things that, 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 you know, these like local politicians and candidates are doing to kind of like help? Yeah, I mean, candidates that are pushing for equal opportunity housing, things like that, that's positive. I mean, getting involved in your local elections and knowing what's happening is probably the biggest impact you have in supporting those politicians and officials who see redlining, who see these issues. There's even a great resource on that greenlining um, website that tells you politicians that support these initiatives and things like that. So, and I think also there's... Um, there are some nonprofits and charities that work to clean up local communities. So if there's like a local community that's not so great next to you, maybe volunteer your time there to help, you know, pick up trash or educate or teach kids or volunteer um, some kind of efforts there. That's what I would recommend from an individual, what you could do like today. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and then I, I um, also, one thing that I was kind of surprised to learn about, right is um, I had always kind of like, as someone who's like lived in one of these like artist neighborhoods and like Chinatowns and stuff, um, and even my neighborhood now, like I live just south of the arts district in LA and my warehouse is way cheaper than the warehouses in the arts district for the same amount of space because this, you know, like there's basically like, you know, south of the arts district, there's like this bridge that once you go across the highway, it's just like noticeably way shittier. And like my neighborhood, it's like, there's like homeless camps and stuff. Like it's yeah, probably, yeah, you can right? tell it's different, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, you can tell like there's probably, we're, we're probably just, just on the other side of one of the red lines, right? Yeah, um, but, <laughs> probably. You know, when you talk to uh, other artists and stuff, they're always like, oh yeah, gentrification, blah, blah, blah. They got all these fucking yuppies coming in and ruining things and blah, blah, blah. You know, but I was actually in, some of my research about um, red lighting and about how how these uh, these you know how people are combating red lighting, it's actually like a lot of these um, organizations, a lot of these candidates are pushing for uh, investment and development in some of these neighborhoods that have been redlined because when you start to bring in people that are in a different uh, income demographic, yeah. right? those right. people are going to pay more taxes right. and the schools are going to get better in that neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. going to be less like, it's going to be less racially homogenous because you know, like what makes it so that the address itself is discriminatory, right? Is when there's no um, economic mixing yep. and there's no ethnic mixing. mixing so as well, right. even yeah. though, you know, it can be, uh, frustrating for some of the local lower income members of a neighborhood when the prices of things start going up as a result of that, um, there are actually some benefits. Because I thought I thought gentr it's like gentrification is bad, like 100%, you know, because people it are also, always like... It also does depend on, right, what company is investing in these properties, right, or building these homes. Like if you see condos and things going up, then you can ask yourself that question too. Like, okay. Yeah. Yeah, but I think, it, I think it's not just like across the board bad. Right, I exactly. Thought it was across not just, the board exactly. It's not across right. the board bad. Right. Um, and then also, um, you know, sometimes they're they're putting affordable housing in some areas that are better off. And that's, that's kind of a way of getting people who are, um, you know, who are in a lower economic brackets into neighborhoods that have better schooling and yep. and that they they're more likely to get a loan yeah, um right. because uh, i was checking out like one of the other articles that i found that was really um really kind of interesting here i'll go back to, to sharing my screen here 
Um, but one of the other articles that I found that was pretty interesting was in Fortune magazine, there was this article called Banking Well Black, uh, how a new generation of leaders is overcoming a legacy of discrimination and mistrust. And in that article, um, there's like kind of like a video podcast and then they summarize the video podcast in writing if you don't have time to watch the whole thing, which is pretty cool. But there was this dude um, named Walthor, I forget his first name, first uh, name, but his last name is Walthor and he was this, um, you know, really, uh, you know, awesome, like entrepreneur kind of uh, dude who's uh, working in the uh, black community to, to help people get loans. And like he runs a, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a FUBU type bank operation, which is pretty cool, really helping people uh, get out of poverty. And he was saying that his number one piece of advice for people is to own real estate. And uh, he said, forget hot stock tips. Owning a house is the best way for people to build equity and later gain greater access to capital, breaking the cycle of wealth disparity. And he said, it's not a secret. It shouldn't be a secret, these educational things, but somehow they seem right. to be a secret. And basically um, they, you know, were saying that, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, they, they, they just like the, the financial literacy out there it, you know, a lot of people are just not financially literate and, and they, you know, they don't know how it is that people actually build wealth. And, you know, there's all these kind of like courses that you can take where it's like, you know, they seem kind of scammy and it's like yeah, some yeah, yeah. get rich quick kind of person. It's just like a turnoff for people and they don't yeah. want to, they don't want to learn. Or, you know, when you go into the bank or whatever, the bank's like, you know, there's like whoever your financial advisor is. A lot of the time, they have like kind of a vested interest in selling, selling you like mutual funds or like yeah, some. So you're you're like it's hard to trust them. their advice. Right. You know, so because they don't teach this stuff at school, you know, I think a lot of people they just like they don't trust these these information sources, so they just end up like not learning about financial yeah. literacy, especially people in these these kind of communities that, that have these problems. So they don't have access to this education, don't have access to any of that. They haven't seen any difference. So yeah, it's financial literacy is one of the most important things you can educate yourself on. Yeah, for sure. And I, I, I think that, um, you know, I think it, like as individuals, every, everyone who's an individual, especially if you're a musician, yeah, you know, like you want to yeah. be, you want to be independent. And I mean, for me, like, like, you know, I have to, I have to do all my own, but like, doing the taxes every year is like really confusing and stuff Same. and like because yeah. I run my own business and everything it's like it's crazy being an independent person it's not like you're just like punching a clock and your wages get deducted or whatever the tax of your wages gets deducted it's like it's all on you yeah you know? so I think it really is important for uh, anyone out there who is either in a career of being a professional musician or or have designs on being a professional musician like get to know about financial literacy and really you know home ownership is so important and that's that's what a lot of this the redlining and the fallout from redlining and this kind of like secret behind closed doors discriminatory yeah. practices that's really how a lot of these a lot of these communities are being kept in poverty and yeah. i think that that's um you know i think one of the take-home messages here that we should have for people is like you know getting to know about financial literacy, getting to know about home ownership. So you're not just like throwing your money away on rent for the rest of your life. Right. You know, like, um, yeah. you know, whether no, no matter. It's not it's no, it's, it should be talked about it. You know, it should be talked about. And I think, um, you know, I think that that's kind of like where I think this, this, these conversation starters things, like it's not, you know, it's not just about, you know, understanding these kind of social issues. It's I'd like, you know, it's about learn. Like I've, I've learned stuff that's useful for, for my life as a white person, you know, like, like about financial literacy and stuff. And I, I learned a bunch of things from, from researching this. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So um, there's uh, this document that you've put together. Uh, let's do like one last, well, why don't you take us like one last run through of your document? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that we can just do a review on everything and that people can be like really clear on everything that we've talked about. Right, right, right. So this document that you guys will all see outlining, starting from the top, talking about what red, what redlining is, um, the process of denying loans, mortgages, insurance. And as you also saw, we talked about denying apartments or places for rent or just denying people uh, access to, to housing based off of their color or um, income class, right? That's redlining. It gets its name from a practice where they would literally draw a red line around a neighborhood and it was based off of classist um, and racist assumptions, right? Of how they created these areas that were, were red. So that's important to know. And we have the link in there where you can go and look at your city 
and find out what your redlining map um, looks like. And I think that'd be interesting for you to see knowing where you live if you, if you lived in one of these areas right now. So talking about that, also the impact that it's had, as we've mentioned a couple of times about building equity and building wealth, um, home ownership is one of those ways to do that. So preventing people of color from getting homes is a way of preventing them from building equity, generational wealth, and it's just the cycle that continues. These neighborhoods suffer, um, the schools suffer, and then the kids can't get the adequate credentials to get into the job market and break that cycle for themselves. So it's just it's ongoing. That's 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 one of the reasons why we see um, such a great educational and wealth disparity today between whites and people of color in the United States. So that's important. And then talking about educating yourself, right? That's one of the most important things you can do. If we can just keep stressing that, educating yourself on what this is, how this affects your local community, financial literacy, just all of these things we've been talking about. Um, that Green Lining Coalition link is right here. So you guys will be able to click that and see it. And then here's the link to that map again. Um, and then talking about staying up to date on your local elections and understanding which politicians are pushing for equal opportunity housing um, and ways you can help in these neighborhoods. And then we've also got um, those screenshots of the, the stories that um, Dylan has shared here with the key takeaways. Okay, cool. So um, I think the key, key takeaways here, I just wanna run through these. Uh, so some of the key takeaways from learning about redlining, uh, this is from one of the articles that I found. Redlining describes a practice that occurs when lending institutions refuse to make loans to people with lower incomes or of a certain race. The practice is prohibited by the Fair Housing Act of 1968 and the Fair Housing Amendments Act of 1988. Being denied a loan to uh, due to economic or credit factors is not considered redlining. What is considered redlining is being discriminated against based on your race, on your gender, on your sexual yeah. orientation, on your religion, stuff like that. So, uh, and then the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is HUD, you know, the HUD is the one that takes redlining complaints online for free. And many of these redlining complaints are done with these, you know, kind of tests and sting operations, and they can they can hook you up. Like if you complain about redlining, they can hook you up with um, uh, some people to help you do these tests and do some of these like sting operations against like a, a specific bank if you're suspecting them of redlining or uh you know a specific landlord or whatever right. uh but it's the hud the housing and urban development the department of housing and urban development that you want to take it up with if you suspect redlining uh and that you know um the green lining institute that's really that's the place where you can get super clear on this and get clear on you know what politicians and initiatives are going on in your town to combat redlining, um, and you know you should totally donate. Join me in donating. I gave them fifty bucks today. It, I feel great about that. <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah, yeah. so please, yeah, please join me in donating. Uh, it's a really good cause. It's helping out communities all around America. This is this is important stuff, people. This really is. Really, yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Well, um, I think that's, that's, uh, that's just about wraps it up. Uh, I just wanted to th say thank you, uh, Rita, DJ Canvas, for taking time out of your busy creative schedule because <laughs> we all know you're making all kinds of killer music. Um, but thank you for taking time out of your creative schedule to, to talk with us about this. And, um, yeah, enjoy your Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. And this is a great way to start a conversation. I love it. Love it. All Let's right. keep going. Lots of love. So um, be sure to take that test, get that uh, trapezoid download. You know, that there's a lot in that project folder for you musicians out there, whether you're going to do a remix or not. Um, you know, if you can pass that test, the trapezoid project file is your reward for taking time to learn about these important issues. So that is Conversation Starters, number one. Lots of love, everybody. Peace out. Yeah.